Hey, Paddle Talk and World Sand Drag News fans. You can watch every episode on World Sand Drag News YouTube along with all of our other content, which is badass sand drag racing action. Or you can find us on Spotify by searching for Paddle Talk. Check out our Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok as well for more content on sand drag racing. Don't forget to check out our website, worldsanddragnews.com, for all of our lists of world records, a schedule of events, articles from past races, and much more. Don't forget to buy our sponsor stuff. Shout out to America's Oasis. They have plenty of ways to stay. They provide a variety of ways to stay near Little Sahara State Park. Choose from a daily, weekly, monthly, or annual reservations in one of their cabins, barns, RV spaces, or primitive camping. If you're only attending for the day, they also offer daily parking and event passes. When they say they have ways to play, they really mean it. Take your pick from a variety of on-site amenities, from fun recreation to everyday conveniences and plan activities, or explore the local area and find a variety of ways to venture off-site. So go to AmericaOasis.com and make a reservation at one of their awesome RV sites. They got full water, full electric at a pretty great price, if you ask me. So go book right now. Shout out to America's Oasis. And on today's show, we will talk about the race going on at America's Oasis, the Sand Outlaw Series race. We will. We also have a Awesome, awesome interview with Tristan Graham and Eric Hickey from the West Coast. Uh, Tristan being from California, Eric Hickey from Vegas. That was a really, really fun interview me and Caleb did. And uh, we'll also talk about the Lake Elsinore race. We have our preview and race picks for that coming up. And we will also review what happened at the Keys Peak Uphill Truck Drags. Um, but what we will start the show with is the unfortunate news of brian harrison's passing um i didn't really know the man myself damien and isaac were closer to him than i was but uh really the best way to put it was what mr mike ellington put on sand drag central's facebook page and we're going to go ahead and uh so i don't mess it up uh, isaac would you please read what mike ellington posted on sand drag central absolutely um yeah mike put a very helpful uh, heartfelt message out there and uh, better than uh, I think anybody else uh, could put it. So I'm just going to read it. Uh, this is Mike talking, obviously. Um, I met Brian about 25 years ago at a Brookville race. He needed help with his fuel injection system. Uh, he had a dragster that he had built with his dad. My brother and I were able to figure out his issues, something with fuel cell placement, if I remember correctly. It wasn't long after that he was diagnosed with cancer the first time. I think we sent a card and gift to his hospital room. I really didn't think much about it and probably didn't understand how serious the situation actually was at the time. But I remember him thanking me the next time he saw me at the track after he was back on his feet. We instantly hit it off and remained friends all these years. Brian started racing at Hasman Acres around age 13 with the adults in a VW sand rail. He moved from the sand rail to a couple of these home-built dragsters, I believe, and my old alter. That would be the brave and crazy altered out of Ellington Chassis Works. Uh, he eventually ended up with that awesome square body truck that he became so famous for, and he won in all of them. Not only was he an awesome driver, he was a mechanical wizard. He was an engine builder, a chassis fabricator, and a skilled machinist. He was the best at working with what he had. He was always thinking, and he was always thinking outside of the box. He had so many cool ideas. He would often shoot me a text of progress he made on whatever he was working on, I was amazed at how much he accomplished over the years. He truly became the go-to guy for help. I have a lot of great memories of hanging at the track, going out to dinner, race banquets, PRI, tractor pulls, a country concert, our kids' birthday parties, trail rides, the list goes on and on. He always cracked me up with his quick wit and his sense of humor. To me and so many of us, uh, Brian was truly one of those friends who may, who feels more like family. Godspeed, speed, Brian. Uh, I met Brian at the PTN race down at Little Sandy when he had the brave and crazy altered. And I was just impressed at how knowledgeable he was about everything and personally how willing he was to share that. Um, that's the one and only time I had met him, but I just remember that uh, then. And yeah, that square body is a bad, bad hot rod. Yeah. Knowing him for all as long as the back as I can remember, because I was a little kid the first time he had dealt with leukemia. I didn't, honestly, until recently, when after his diagnosis, I hadn't known that he had dealt with it before. 
he had just finished up working round the clock, basically preparing Rodney Upchurch's truck last year for Gravel Rama, the Red Blazer that he runs. And then right after that started having issues. And then right around Gravel Rama is when he got the diagnosis for cancer again. I mean, we, we all really knew it was coming. I hate to say that, but at the same time, I don't think any of us, any of us were really prepared to lose him. He, again, like Isaac said, like Ellington said, the man could figure anything out when it came to a race car, whether it be Volkswagen's nitrous alcohol injection. Hell, even with the brave and crazy alder, he would experiment with nitromethane. He, and he would be willing to tell you or give you advice any way he could to help you with your program. I'd never really had the fortune to meet the man. Um, I actually got to meet him. Well, I, I, I take that back. I actually met him once. I believe it was my, it was either gravel on 50 or my first gravel on I ever been to. And he had the, he had the truck, you know, and I just remember talking about it and how he built it. And he just kind of blew my mind at how much detail he went into after I asked him just like a couple questions about his truck. Um, so yeah, rest in peace, Brian Harrison. We'll move on here and uh, we'll talk about our review of the uh, Keys Peak uphill truck drags. And before we list off these winners, uh, and I'll ask the same thing to Isaac after you answer. Um, anything stick out to you after this weekend? Um, some new cars that debuted at Keys Peak this weekend just completely blowing my mind with how fast they're going to be this year. Do you so care that to expand on that? Point. <laughs> Do you um, care to expand on that? <laughs> well, main one, and this is just going to be kind of a spoiler of what the ending list ended up being in E class. You have the, you have Nick, the De, DeBar, or De, however you want to say his last name. DeBoer. 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 De yep. Um, he debuted a brand new Jeep CJ7 that he just built with a Hal Halthus or Halthus? Holtoff. Holtoff racing engine, a 406 LS with a F2 Pro Charger on it. And there really wasn't anybody that was touching him in the cut tire class. It, everyone else, they would take off and you would just see him sit there and spin as this Jeep would just skip on up the hill. Wow. That uh, I think I didn't see a whole ton of videos from the event. I did see a handful, but one that really stuck out to me, and I don't know their name, but I know uh, we talked about it last time. Old Rogue, Old Rogue was driving it. Um, that green and black Jeep from Canada, Bron I believe. The Bronco. Right? The Bronco. Excuse me. Uh, I think it was sick. That thing looked like it. It. That thing looked like it just ate that hill alive. It just went up it without a problem. I could be wrong though, but it looked like it went really fast up that hill. Thing is a constant contender. If you go check out Back Channel Productions, it is a constant contender in the Outlaw Pro Stock class on cut tires, where they spray a lot of nitrous through that thing. And apparently, this winter they went through and found some more horsepower. Oh wow, that's awesome, Isaac. You got something to say? You got anything that stuck out to you after the Keys weekend? Hey, man, how about Jason Benson with the best bait and switch we've seen in a while? He posts up the picture of that Jeep, and I would have swore that thing was green. And what was it? Like, was it 12 hours later, 24 hours later? No, Sight gets actually red. That was awesome. Uh, job, very man. good. Very great. good job of photo editing to keep that one under wraps. It was, man, because it was good. I mean, I was looking at that photo over pretty well, and I got to admit, man, it fooled me because I would have swore that thing was green until the picture of it red popped up. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, I am not finding the picture of the class list right now, so I'll just go off the winner sheets here. So I'm not going to be able to give you a full description on what all of these classes were for what the rundown was other than the last three. But A class, you had Bobby Clemo, who apparently in the street class is kind of cleaned up because he also won B class. Second place in A class, you have Jim Schmidt. B class again, Bobby Clemo and Bill Gamble in second. C class, you have Tyler Barrett and Paul Wegner. I'm 
not sure who that is off the top of my head on either one of those. Tyler um, Tyler Barrett is the black uh, like TJ YJ oh, with the Turbo, Turbo LS in it. Okay, I know that one now. Tyler um, got first, you said. Yep. And who got uh, second? one of the booze, um second is Paul Wegner. Wegner. And I, I'll have to I'd have to go through and find pictures, figure out what vehicle that one is. D class, they're naturally aspirated open class. Okay. Michael Dorsey, aka Mike Honcho. I believe that's the green Jeep, ain't it? I believe so. Upsetting kind of the hitter that went there. Brendan Whitgen with the four-play Jeep. A Jeep that not okay. that long ago in MRA won the Renegade class, the Outlaw Pro Stock, and the Pro Stock class is all with a naturally aspirated motor, I believe, set, or a little over 700 cubic inches. Yeah, that thing is a player any place it's at. I mean, that's just how it is. E class, we start getting into the power adder stuff. This is the cut tire class. First place, as we said earlier, Nick DeBoer, brand new Pro Charged LS CJ7. Second place, Dan Otis Sizemore in the Swamp Donkey, Ryan Kerr's twin turbo LS Bud Body Jeep oh. chassis work done by Rotus Fabrication down here. Nice. That thing is always a riot to watch anywhere it goes. Shout um, out Kerr, yeah, Kerr went out early in the in the paddle tire class earlier in the day. It started going right, and I, judging by the live stream, I'd say he hit the scramble button. I'm not going to assume, though, because about a third of the way, two-thirds of the way up the hill, he's just stood it up on the wheelie bar on snow. Must have been um, leaf springs. <laughs> ladder bars, no leaf springs. <laughs> Whatever. Third place, you had Michael Dorsey again in the green Jeep. Then in F class, this is the big open class. Anything goes. First place, our A Sport modified and A Sport modified four wheel drive record holder, Jason Benson, in his Jeep, freshly painted, freshly powder coated, whole toss power, big pro charge, big block. Second place again, Michael Dorsey with the green Jeep. So he was doing good up there. And then third place, I don't know what vehicle it is, but Ray Mills. Do you know who that is, Isaac? I think it's like an S10, if I'm not mistaken. A black S10. Okay. Very similar, or S10 or Colorado. I think it's pretty similar to uh, uh, the Hysteria truck of um, uh, Jason Vanderwall. Okay. I get what you're saying there. So, yeah, that is your rundown of the what we have for podium or trophy winners in those classes at Keys Peak. Some wild machines definitely this year. Um, McCord with the White Buffalo, they were chasing ignition issues all weekend. Yes. Did you see the picture Jason Benson posted his Jeep with all four tires off the ground? Crazy. <laughs> The, that is the one wildest thing. That's if I were to have to take if I were to take my Jeep up there. That's one thing I'd be redoing is suspension mounts, making sure they're as tough as possible. Because holy mackerel, the abuse some things take. Absolutely, John Sorg's on with us now too. By the way, yep, Jay. Hey, how's it going, guys? What's up, buddy? I am terrible at <laughs> introducing the panel before we start. <laughs> I'll cut that out. Um, so, um, all in all, it seemed like a pretty good weekend. I wonder how the spectator count looked. The one video I saw, it was like seven, eight deep at the at the sides. I mean, it was pretty impressive. You know, nice. I don't know what they have for you know, like concession or anything like that. What a spectator cost was, but there looked to be plenty of people there. So. Shout out to Ray Dion Mills and uh, that group, though, for putting this together. Very impressive. Um, yeah, that's really cool. Yes, it is. Shout out to them. Shout out to uh, the ski resort, the ski hill people that let them do that on. Shout out to the town that lets them do that. That's really cool. Oh, totally. Uh, Any big surprises you think over the weekend there, John, up there in Keys Peak? 
Yeah, John, you, you just joined us. You got any you, you, anything stick out to you from Keys uh, uphill truck drags? I have really. I just caught the end of uh, Jason Benson taking the win and uh, got kind of busy in the garage on my own stuff. So, oh, so you didn't you didn't update yourself with I, what was going on in Keys? I didn't. I did not do a very good job. I what the fuck? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is I did an uphill snow drag and I got a lot of snow on me and that froze all day. So <laughs> I was out after that. Okay. That's funny. Todd Willingham's truck, it was running really good until uh, he hit one of them big ruts. He brought up a, basically a, a street square body Chevy that he just dropped a 712 cubic inch big block in. Yeah, you know. Send it. And he, uh, the front end hit the oil pan and put a pretty big dent in it. <laughs> he, uh, Brendan, Brendan Wiggin also has a pretty mean uh, square body with a bunch of big block under the hood that he's been uh, running at some of the more streetable classes as well. I don't know if he brought it with him over there. I think he just brought the Jeep, but he also has that in his back pocket as well. Here's hoping we see some of these guys try for our Pier Street gas record. It's down in the 440s right now. Just So who knows where it could go with combinations like this out there. Yeah. Okay, we're going to move on to the SoGal Sand Drag Association race preview for this weekend. Their spring chaos. March 15th through 17th. Um, no, no, no motorcycles. No four-wheeled motorcycles at this race. I know that hurts your feelings a little bit, doesn't it, Billy? <laughs> just recently became an ATV guy, so if I planned a trip to go out there and then they were like, oh, yeah, no bikes, and I, I would be a little hurt. I would, uh, you know, and I feel for Caleb, really. They got a new bike, you know, they won't go run it. Um, oh, yeah. I feel That's a really – that's an interesting turn of events, not going to lie. Yeah. And I would – yeah, we kind of we we spoke about it, but le- on one of the other episodes. But yeah, it, it is kind of weird, and uh, you know, and Tristan, we had we actually have a pretty good conversation with Tristan Graham and Eric Hickey about uh, alternatives to do to try to bring the bikes back to Elsinore. Um, it seems like Tristan um, helps out a lot with certain track prep and stuff like that, and then um, Eric was just very helpful in what he had to say with that stuff too. So. Um, I'm definitely should... looking forward to seeing his Hemi car out. Oh yeah, that's gonna be very awesome, very awesome indeed. Since they took the bikes out of the program, thank you for that, Damien. Since they took the bikes out of the program, uh, their schedule looks to be a lot shorter. So they're gonna end a lot quicker. I guess that's a positive you could look at at least. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much quicker, maybe like 15 minutes quicker, 20 minutes quicker. But, um, so, but I did see they're actually doing the, uh, they're doing the Duner shootout class again. Uh, first place, a thousand, second place, 500, third place, and fourth place each get a hundred bucks. So that's pretty cool. What do you uh, have to be to be in that Duner class? Uh, what are the rules for that? Let me see. The Duner shootout returns. This is the class that pits all Dune able, Dunable cars against each other in one giant bracket race this class is designed for true dune cars not just those hill shooters that have to be towed to comp hill the general rules that the general rules are that you need to actually be able to take your vehicle on a real dune trip no wheelie bars no solid strut vehicles see chachi zavala kevin williams or tim gilmore to ensure your vehicle can enter so it looks like they get the final say so that's pretty interesting Best reaction time, 150 bucks. Closest to dial, 150 bucks. Uh, my first question about this class to John Sword: Does your buggy Uh-oh. fit the rules for this class? Yeah. No, oh, there you go. You run Wiley out there. I can take Wiley out there. We could take him out west. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, Isaac, Isaac, do you have any cars dunable for this Duner shootout class? 
No, but I'm gonna let uh, anyone the, with the last name of Adamson uh, run in my place out there, and <laughs> I'm pretty sure I got a. I, I feel like I've got a really good shot to collect some money on that deal. So, is that your official race pick? Absolutely. <laughs> I get the whole family though. I'm not picking just one. I want the whole family. The whole family? Yes. Well, I'll take. I'll at least take the kid. How about I'll let you have Jeff, and I'll take Justin and, and uh, was it Blake? Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's totally, I get who? I wait. Who do I get? You can have Jeff. I got Jeff. All right. Bet. Yeah. All Don't right. Don't fail me, Jeff. <laughs> All I right. Mean, uh, Damien, do you have? Does is your Jeep dunable? I mean, if I really wanted to go through the effort, I could probably go out and put it on the dunes with a set of mufflers up in Michigan. It'd be yeah, a rough ride. But you can't. Or... But you can't run your wheelie bar. Would you be all right? I can put. I ain't got to run the bottle in that class. So on twenties, I'd be fine. Oh, there you go. yeah, that's true. I don't Plus, even have looks to better the... on twenties. <laughs> that it does. I will totally <laughs> agree with that. And out there, you don't have to run mufflers. So I mean, you could run it if it's Duner Southern yeah. California style. Yeah. All right. It, it's one of those jeeps. It would be a rough ride, but I wouldn't be because I I used to run that thing around at Cleves making. There's times I've made 20 some odd passes in a night and not had it towed, but maybe once or twice the whole evening. And that's a long trek around a track. Yeah, it is. All right. So I'm going to do race picks a little different this time. I am going to pick a class and pick one of you to just choose a winner randomly. Like you're not even going to think about it. I'm just going to pick a class. I'm going to pick a person. And you guys are just going to choose a winner. Okay. So, um, First things first, I'll go first with top alcohol. My pick is Jim Hammond. <laughs> 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 well, we all, well, I should say we also did Ooh. race picks. We all <laughs> shut up. No, like, all, <laughs> we also did race. We also did race picks with uh, Tristan and Eric. So that was fun. Also, those are different race picks than what we're doing now. Uh, we'll go to top eliminator two ninety five index. Uh, I'll go with John Sorg. Who do you pick? I gotta go with Kyle Farway. Good call. You think for you think Farwell's going to run Eliminator? I did he he's going pro. I don't know. Is he? I don't know. It's typically, they, I know they're going out there with a kind of a chip on their shoulder for a record that they lost recently. Uh oh. So maybe he won't <laughs> be in there. They got to go whole tent faster though. So I don't know. Very true, but that's. You never know with that bunch. They, they, oh, by they, the way, they, by the way, about, since we brought up Kyle Farwick, uh, Kyle, come on the show. I don't know if you listen to it or not, but come on the show. I hit him up, and he said he wouldn't do it. So I don't know if you're too shy or something, but please come on what? the show. <laughs> at least get your dad. He, he said he wouldn't come on the show, but hey, if Kyle, if you can't get your dad, I would love to have. I would love. Oh, to have yeah. Him. yeah, that would be <laughs> awesome. Dad the yeah. Okay. So we're moving on. Uh, a fuel. Uh, Isaac, pick a winner in a fuel. I don't know how many is going to be there. Probably maybe lower. I don't, actually, I have no idea. Pick a winner for a fuel. Oh, Daniel King all the way. Daniel King. Nice. Daniel, because Daniel's driving the short fuse car, right? Uh. Yes. 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 Yep. Oh, that is my pick. Daniel King. Don't let me down, buddy. If you do, well, we may have to take your name away from you, but that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> that's funny. Um. All right, Damien, I gave you the fun one here. Pro Mod Unlimited. Don't mess it up. It all <laughs> depends on who shows up, but I would have to go just for consistency's sake. I'm going to have to go with Kyle. That car goes A to B 90% of the time anywhere they go. You think Kyle, do you think Kyle will run both classes? No. I, I, I doubt it, but at the same time, you never know, but I would put Kyle Farwick as winning Pro Mod because he went out there last year. He was not the fastest car in the field, but every other pass other than their first pass that weekend, they went A to B every time. That is true. It, is Schultzman going this weekend? Yes. I would think. Yes, I was going to say, I saw him servicing the car the other night on Facebook. So, And then the other question is, is how many of the Jeeps will be there? Also true. Yeah. Well, you know DePass will probably be there. If Tristan is running the Hemi, then you know DePass will probably want to be there to help him out because I think DePass had a hand in helping 
Tristan getting the Hemi together in his car. I don't know exactly details what he did. Here's hoping they can break that buggy record and drag another buggy out of retirement. No kidding. I would love to see that buggy coming out of retirement. Um, So I got, uh, they do some other classes. Those were their heads up classes, but there are other classes they got for like your more budget guys. They have a 395 index pro one, which is 310 to 375 bracket class. They have Pro 2, which is 375 to 425 bracket class. They have Pro 3, 426 to 60 bracket class. And then they do Sport 1, 350 to 450 bracket. Sport 2, 450 and slower bracket. They also have a Pro Gambler on Friday and Saturday, which is just an open bracket for all cars and side-by-sides on a Pro Tree. And then they, of course, have the Duner Shootout, which we kind of did picks for that already. Um, I'm going to... I don't know. Do you guys know any? Are you guys well familiar? How Wayne about Gun. how? What? No. Wayne Gunner. There you go. All right. Great pick. <laughs> yeah. Wayne Gunner. There you go. There you go. Um, go Wayne. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. And I will actually give a. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he'll actually be at this race or not. But uh, if my dog Chris Wells from Oregon is going to be there, I'm going to choose him to win a class too. Shout out my dog Chris Wells. Um, it would be cool That's to it. see Wayne make that. How many hours is that trip from Georgia to? It's freaking... probably it has to be about the same for us here in Indiana because it's honestly a little bit straighter shot for him than it is for us. Well, I know you yeah. googled it. Then how long is it, Damien? <laughs> uh, let me pull up Google. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, while Damien's doing that, um, I think, man, what do you think that Jeep of Wayne's is going to run out there? Do you think he might dip into the three sixties? Maybe. Ah, uh, let's see. What was his record, Et, for the D Sport Modifieds right now? That small block Hemi. Small block, small block four. four. Yeah, three hundred two Ford based Hemi. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he calls it a small block Hemi, doesn't he? Yeah, it is. It up on it's, the a, phone. it's basically a Boss 429 Hemi head shrunk down to do small block four. Like now, six. the crazy thing about those heads is if I had the unlimited budget to do it, I could put them heads on my LS as well. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's crazy what those engines or what some of these engines are getting up to nowadays in power. He is north of 900, I believe with that Hemi right now. Right. So Hunter Automotive. Okay. So, so we're... fun fact about Wayne. Sure. The first time he showed up at a pro truck race, I saw where he was from. And I'll be honest, I thought that Georgia was a misprint. Somebody was messing with me. So I said, Lordsburg, Indiana, and Mike Ellington had to text me in the tower. He goes, no, seriously, it's Georgia. All righty. For Wayne <laughs> Gunter, from his, from his Napa, part, or Napa shop, it is 2,200 miles, 32 hours. Good. 32, yeah. 32-hour drive. Shout out to Wayne Gunner. Shout, Shout out to Sandra. Out, buddy. That's and what from, for me. From Same our about 2,200 from miles. my area, from... Where I'm at right now, Liberty, Indiana, it's a 38-hour trek. So this is one of the few times with Wayne racing with some of our locals that he's going to be the closer one to the track. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, well, uh, I might cut out this part. I wish I knew more about West Coast racers to actually talk about some of the West Coast bracket racers. Um, I know. wonder if Bailey will have it, his El Camino or his dad's truck out there. Oh, actually, you know what? I forgot um, Russ Bailey and Dennis Burroughs are actually making the trip out to Elsinore. I forgot oh, to nice. That. Russ Bailey's what? taking the Alder. Uh, Dennis Burroughs is taking... I believe he's just taking the little car, which is the uh, uh, the one he gets so much shit for about wearing the shorts. The did did he take his fire? Did he take his pants with him? <laughs> he he knows the drill out there. He probably did. Um, <laughs> Damien Damien likes to call Dennis's car uh, a racing suit. He doesn't call it a car. He calls it a suit. <laughs> there ain't much car there. <laughs> it's, it's it's a frame welded together. That's all you need, ain't it? 
It's like 10 pieces of tubing. It's done. <laughs> then again, that's the normal for the Volkswagen crowd, ain't it, John? Ah, yeah. Oh. It's pretty, pretty oh, typical. Some of them setups in the... Okay, that, that we'll talk about that in a different episode. We're going to actually kick it over to the interviews that we did with Tristan Graham and Eric Hickey. Really fun time. Great interviews. Enjoy them. Uh... Tristan may have hurt some feelings with what he, what he said in the rebuttal to some of the talk that's been going on. But, um, you know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, we're all working together to uh, um, bring bikes back to Elsinore and provide a safe track for them and, uh, you know, just provide racing for everybody, more or less. So we'll give a shout out to our friends at More Racing. More Racing specializes in high quality ATV parts and builds. More Racing was the first two stroke in the first ATV in the twos. The first four-wheeler in the twos they are now offering their services and experiences to customers by offering custom nitrous installs full builds and general maintenance also be sure to hit them up for all your scat track tires needs and right now you a free nitrous backfire edition shirt with every nitrous install as well (laughs) (laughs) oh my god are they really (laughs) Here is the interview with Tristan Graham and Eric Hickey. Welcome back. We are back with two, actually three, first-time guests. We are with Tristan and Kylie Graham, and we also have Eric Hickey. And uh, we are going to have them introduce themselves real quick, and we'll start with Tristan and Kylie. Tristan, Kylie, go ahead and give us a quick introduction of yourselves. What's up, everybody? My name is Tristan Graham. Um, I am the founder of Triple Threat Racing, as well as the driver of the whiskey business, Top Eliminator Sand Buggy, uh, Pipe Dreamer of the World Record Holder someday. And uh, I am the husband to the cooler Kylie Graham, who drives Frisky Business. Not so much cooler. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kylie Graham. I drive Frisky Business. And uh, yeah, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Eric, go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Um, Eric Hickey, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. I drive the excessive force, small block powered uh, altered. And uh, I don't have any pipe dreams other than just be the coolest small block out there. Well, you're doing pretty good right now. So. Yeah. Um, so, Eric. Just give us your story real quick here, how you got started in the sport and compared to where you are now, just give us your story of how you got started in this sport. Um, you know, I, I think what's the age you can start racing five. Uh, my dad got me a Yamaha 80. I started racing. I raced Kayla. I raced Tristan. We grew up racing each other. Um, and then from there I got a, it is a altered with like a, funny car jeep body with a just a hillborn injected small block i did that for a couple years and then uh my dad ended up going into the dragster so i took over his car um and i used all his spare parts put a little motor together and raced pro I, i just started off basically in pro one with that car and then now i'm slowly getting up to the top limiter class with it. And for what that motor is, it's pretty good little little top limiter motor. Um, slow end of top limiter, I should say. Uh, I am actually currently putting together what I think is the right combo of small block for top eliminator, bigger blower, a little bigger cubic inch, and uh, – that's basically it. We're, we'll find out probably April. I'm going to miss the next two races. One of the races is due to Caleb's wedding. I'm missing. Just throw that out there. <laughs> Shout out to Caleb getting married. Yes. Oops. We're happy for him. But uh, yeah, so I think April is going to be the time my car is going to be back out. And uh, hopefully we'll have my dad's car put together as well to go out there and hopefully raise some hell. Or blow up again. <laughs> yeah, you guys tend to do those uh, those little fireballs pretty uh, pretty often with those small blocks when you push them. Out. Um, it's it's mostly my dad that blows up. <laughs> I just want to put that out there. <laughs> I've been pretty good up until this last race. We did hurt the head the last race, but we got it all back together about. And uh, 
I I've been waiting. Parts are since COVID hit. Parts have been pretty hard to get. Certain things, I should say, and uh, so I'm still waiting to regear my dad's car to get it back together. The motor's finally done, um, and then my new motor is just basically running out of money and trying to get more money to put it together all the way. Eric, why don't you tell us a little bit about that new motor that you're putting together? What's uh, what's different on this new combo versus your old motor? So the old motor is just a 355 with a 671 blower. Um, and I my best time on record on that Caleb will count at least is a 314. Uh, <laughs> but it, ha- it has ran a 378 at Dome Valley. Just saying. 278, you mean? A 378. Yeah, 378. <laughs> That's impressive, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> and, but uh, the new motor... The new motor is going to be a 377, and I'm putting a uh, 1071 on it. Um, and I, I, I mean, the fuel systems, my fuel systems are sent off to Randy Anderson. And that's about it, really, with the new motor, just a little bigger and a little bigger blower. So we don't have to push it so hard. Uh, we we're pretty close with that 355, I think. I mean, my 60 foots are right there with top eliminator, but I just ain't got the top end like them big blocks and hemis. So we're, we're, I got to do something different. I can't keep blowing stuff up. (laughs) Well, Hey, I mean, certainly the the extra cubic inches there. And that's not just a little bit bigger of a blur. That's a, that's a fair step up from a 671. So you should be able to spin a little bit more boost in there. What, what are you running or what were you running with the 671? Um, I mean, that blower is pretty stout, that 671. I mean, I was only running at about 20%, and we were pushing 20 to 25 pounds of boost, depending on the air. Uh, The last pass I made with it, I turned it up to uh, 26% overdriven, and I took 40 out of the main, and uh, the main pill, I should say, and we had to blow up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It happens. (laughs) <laughs> well hey at, at least you didn't take out all the cones again yeah yeah we didn't do that but that, that who knows anymore you might have already said this but you said that uh you're gonna have uh your, your dad's dragster and you got your car next time you guys go out oh yeah that's that, you know my dad's car um has been a learning curve we put that Whipple 980 on it, and the screw blower is just a totally different animal from a roots blower. Um, we fought okay. motor timing and fuel, trying to get it figured out. I think we got that figured out. Then we blew up the transmission, got that figured out, and uh, we're just really high geared on that car. It's got a 650 gear, um, and so I've ordered new gears for it, and. Uh, Everything's just on back order. Every month I get an update on how it's going to be another month. So, and apparently no one's got a set of gears that we're looking for. Is, man, tragic. That is the worst problem to have. Yeah. Well, um, we'll, we're going to go over to Tristan here. Tristan and Kylie, uh, mainly, I mean, I, this question might be more for Tristan since Kylie's more newer to the sport, but uh, Tristan, how did you get started in the sport? We know that, uh, you know, your dad's been in it for a while. So tell us how you got started and uh, compared to where you are now. And then obviously you brought Kylie along and how she got started. Yeah, of course. Um, I started same thing with Eric. I was young. Uh, I don't know. Back in the day, it had to have been four or five, something like that on a, uh, on an LT80, a little quad. And slowly moved my way up through the ranks. I actually raced on a nitrous bike for a while, <clears throat> Caleb, and uh, mm-hmm. did that for a minute. And then um, <laughs> <laughs> I raced with Caleb. We And uh, I moved up into – I got into a dragster for a while. Mike Cazzini sponsored me uh, for a couple races in a dragster, and that really got the bug going while I was building my car. And uh, then from there, I put what I could afford in my car. I had a dual car, big block on nitrous in my car and uh ran that for a few years and just slowly made my way up through the ranks um from pro two or three at the time to 
um, top eliminator now. Um, following that, recently we started trying to pursue this world record with the buggies, but um, it's been a battle. It turns out being the world's fastest is really hard. Um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought there. I was going to tell you something about that car before I got to the world record. Um, so tell us about like the different combinations you've had in it since like the, the original bit block. I know you guys have had like some boat motor combos, some spare parts from your dad's car before. It's been a, a lot of yeah. iterations of that. <laughs> you know, that went through my mind. And then I was like, how long do they want this podcast to really be? Cause there's been a few motors. Um, so the first big block I ever bought, I bought when I was 15 years old and I put it in a flat bottom. And then that motor is the one that ended up in my car. It was a 468 with iron heads, dual 750 Hollies, 250 shot of nitrous, 13 to one compression and a power glide. And it ran 370s, real consistent. Um, I then thought that uh, I would go injected. I went to a fuel injection system and fought the hell out of it, man. I, I, uh, <laughs> It had a bad fuel pump, and I didn't know. I was young. I was like 18, just trying to figure out why I couldn't make this bug catcher work on my car. So I fought it, fought it, fought it, and finally I I had enough of that, and I bought a blower and bought a good rotating assembly and a better brand-new fuel pump. Um, mind you, this whole time I have to give a shout-out to them. Um, good Vibrations Motorsports has never once made me feel like I was wasting their time. I, since I've been uh, – 17 18 years old trying to learn this they have always given me the time of the day to learn and to grow with them like they've been a really really good group of folks so i, I went to a blown injected motor it was a 468 with brodix heads um small blower 671 and then eric was saying you know his 60 foot times are right there with top eliminator but your et a mile per hour is where you struggle and i Dude, I feel that. I feel that so to the core. I, that car was so quick, but you get three cones from the shutdown thinking you got them wrapped up and all of a sudden there'd just be a wheel in your peripheral. Like, you're like where the hell did that guy come from every time? So I built a, uh, I actually, I, I, I bought a KB Olds from um, Jimmy to pass, ironically. And you'll, you'll find out why that's ironic here in a minute, but I bought a KB Olds from him that was in his Jeep. And I ran that for a while, and that motor was violently fast. It worked really well, but I couldn't find parts for it. It was really hard to find parts for an Allen Johnson head. And they had this custom rocker arm assembly where it had like a Chevrolet shaft mount rocker on the intake. But the exhaust was similar to a Hemi intake rocker. It had like a jog over on it, but it wasn't a Hemi intake rocker. So, in other words, very hard to find parts for. So, in a bind... I got a good deal on what is now in Kylie's car. It's a Rodak 540 from Mark Whitmore. And um, I, I freshened it up and I ran it in my car and we did really good with that. That's the motor that has kind of gotten the car, like I feel like on, on the maps. Um, it, we ran a string of 80s between an 83 and an 87 over the years that I set up. And that was just flirting with the record, but it never quite could do it without uh, – hurting it i felt like we were really getting close to you could just feel shit you could feel it in the car like you could feel it just barely floating the valves or the blower was just starting to build heat like you we were spinning at 33 percent over and it was making 33 pounds of boost and then we'd spin at 39 percent over and it would just make heat and 33 pounds of boost so i knew that i had a really nice piece and i did not want to ruin it because i'm 27 years old and and we have two of these things i'm trying to just keep up so i uh I decided to take a year out, give or take, it's a year and a half. And we put the motor in her car and I turned it way down. It had a 1471 on it, 40% over uh, against a Lenko clutch, two, two disc with a nine inch forward on big tires, all that, all that good jazz. And we put it in my wife's car, 10% over with a 1271. Um, it's not a high helix blower. It's got a smaller injector half actually sitting right here. You can see it in the background. Um, and, uh, I, I had every intention of just making a really cool 330 car. I just wanted her to go out there and have fun and be consistent. And it's just a good ride. It's a wheelie. It's all the good pieces without the, the work, you know? So she has a power glide in her car and, uh, 
the fucking thing goes out and runs 300 at like 113 miles an hour at like 14 pounds of boost. Like it's not even working hard. It's like, you know, there's a lot to be said about this um, <laughs> when it's hanging off the front of the car. <laughs> so um, any questions so far? It's been a fucking journey, I know. No, but, I think they're good. So, no, I love hearing about the world's fastest beam card. <laughs> <laughs> so we were standing in here drinking beer as one religiously does and uh i'm looking at her car and i'm like thinking i should put a front end on it i want to build an ar in front end that beam shit stupid and then i'm like it might be the world's fastest beam car now it's gone 300 and then i put it out there and i guess that's confirmed it's not anything it's not a record it's a fucking record no it doesn't matter but <laughs> tell you what if you're standing around in the garage drinking a beer world's fastest beam car okay <laughs> world's fastest beam car right there so i um i bought a hemi and i was just running out to get a hemi i you know I, I had a i had an idea that i was gonna go out and just burn the world down and uh i i got this hemi from some real special people um the pat norris racing crew um that motor was marcus's motor it wasn't the one that was in his car when it happened when the accident happened but that is a motor that they had. Uh, it was his just previous block and stuff. So I bought um, the block and a couple sets of heads and some sleeves and a crank and rods from them and a manifold. Rick Akers was the man who bought all of uh, Marcus's stuff up, and uh, he he knew me and hooked me up. So it was it was just a cool family deal. And uh, again, Jimmy DePass comes back into the picture. I can't speak highly enough about him. I, I thoroughly love that man. He's like a second dad to me, um, which is a tough thing to say because my dad's a real good dad. But he he uh, he brought me under his wing and really showed me the ropes on these Hemis. I, I, they're, they're very different while also being very similar. And that's real confusing when you're really comfortable with the Chevrolet configuration. So he taught me a lot. He um, showed me a lot of the ropes and got me connected with a lot of good people to get parts for my motor to make it affordable. And um, what I was telling you guys before we got this going, that was Marcus's motor. Uh, my race car number is 349. I'm going to go off on a little side tangent and tell you why it's 349 and then I'll come back. But my dad's race car is called the excavator. And when he named it the excavator, it's because it's what we do for a living. We run excavators. And at the time we had a bunch of 345B caterpillars. So my dad's number is 345. And when we built my car, my number is 349 because right when my car got done, the next generation Caterpillar excavators came out and they were 349s. So now you know why. But nice. when I had my block upside down and we were putting the crank in it at the pass the shop, the serial number on Marcus's old motor is 349, which is pretty oh, wild. Wow. Isn't that crazy? crazy? Yeah. So it's done now. I'm literally the last three parts are sitting on this table that came in the UPS as the podcast got started. And uh, I got to put them on tonight and we're going to go start it at um, the passes farm tomorrow at a shop. So nice. Well, hell yeah. Take, take some awesome. video of that. We'll, we'll, we'll share it to the, the Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we'll put it in this video right now. Yeah. Ooh. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's pretty much my spiel. Uh, there's a lot I could continue on with, but I don't want to burn up your guys' podcast. you have any questions? Oh, well, no. I mean, we got tons let's, of questions. Let's hear from your better half, the, the cooler part of Triple Threat, <laughs> as we've established. So, Kylie, uh, obviously, you're you're newer to the sport of sand drags with this. Congratulations uh, for being the world's fastest beam car record holder. <laughs> I'm never going to let that down, please, babe. <laughs> you better make decals for that and put it on the car somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we're making shirts. We'll be selling them. <laughs> but yeah, t- tell hey, us that's a little bit about your journey. We won't blow um, this up at all, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> when I came in the picture when he was first finishing whiskey, so I got to help him with that. And ever since then, I've been there watching and not really being a part of it. But I, I don't even remember what it was. The blaster, I mm-hmm. raised that like two or three times and I raced the general a couple times and then this that 
motor he was talking about earlier that he bought for the flatty that he made it sound all like sentimental. Blew that up. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first motor to go in my car. Oh yes, I. I you know what? <sighs> yeah, I, we'll have to throw it. I think I've got that. Uh, that yeah, video. If you don't have it, I'll send it to you. Okay. Put that we'll put that in here. You guys will get a kick out of it here on the podcast. <laughs> um, let's just say uh, the Graham's Christmas parties are, are fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it didn't even blow it up racy. He blew it up at a Christmas party and then took a break to have some babies and had a carburetor motor. And then now I have this one, the 540. And still new, still learning it, but it's a blast. And I can't wait to actually be competitive with the TE crowd. What, what, was the hardest, what was the hardest <laughs> part to try to get over whenever you were learning this machine? Um, myself, talking to myself and making myself mm -hmm. feel like I can do it. Because the car is easy. The car is, he built the car. And it's smooth. It's fast. It doesn't have any real issues that we know of, except for the clutch. When we have the clutch in it, it had an issue. But I have a car glide now. Oh. I'll interject on that. I that's my that's my bad. That the reason that motor blew up was um, I put like a it was a little bit too small of a clutch can on her car. So when she would take off, she used to have a clutch against the old motor that was uh, my old blown alcohol first motor. Um, and when she would take off, the fingers would come out and hit the throw out bearing on the clutch and disengage it. So it was just basically free spinning down the track, melting the clutch disc and Oh. I had never, never had that happen. So, uh, it went to Avenal one race and I tried to do something dramatic and get an answer out of this car. And, uh, I did something dramatic and she went out there and it turned like 11, five. And I was like, wow, surprise it stayed together. Well, it stretched all the rod caps and then spun a bearing and threw a rod cap off it at the Christmas party when she was revving it and, uh, just shit the bed everywhere. It was pretty eventful. <laughs> Not to interject, carry on. Um, just... Yeah, I don't remember where I was, but tell them the story of the car itself. Um, we he one day for Valentine's Day he brought home a small block, and that was my Valentine's a small block <laughs> and a VW buggy, and he said I'm cutting it in half and putting a small block in it, and this is yours. And I don't remember really what happened, but you it kind of kept a small block in it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hey man, everybody has a lapse in judgment, you know? <laughs> got through it. But that, <laughs> that project got put on hold and we just never really did anything with it. And then his brother was like, I want to build something. I'm over the bikes. So he went and bought the rear end to start rebuilding this car. And then like a month later is when he passed away. Mm -hmm. So we finished it and put it together in his name. And I'm back in the seat driving it. So the, every number in triple threat has a meaning behind it. Like my dad's and mine, and then hers is 344, 344 being, um, three for triple threat. And then my brother and her both ironically yeah. played baseball and softball and their numbers were four. So. We both had four growing up. Oh, wow. So a whole lot of things that fall together in that. Yeah. A lot, a lot of meaningfulness right there. That's pretty cool. Yes. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so it's, sometimes it's very hard to drive that car, but it's worth it. Hey, we've seen you dirt track that thing a couple times, Kylie, and you. <laughs> another. We'll have to. I'll, I'll get you that photo, Billy, of her at uh, Elsinore, getting a pretty good sideways on that. Yeah, we'll put it right here. Yeah, Beam was working hard on that one, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you got any meaning behind your numbers that you and your dad chose for your guys' cars? So, no, not really, but kind of. <laughs> um, so the the cage and the – I mean, the car's been redone a million times, uh, but the, the actual cage from where basically your legs are to where you sit, my dad found the chassis in the middle of Armagosa Desert. It was a funny car chassis chopped in half, and, I mean – 
Uh, the number just let, out, just let out there to die in the middle of the desert. No yeah. food, no water. Just, just pretty much. <laughs> and, uh, at, least, at least this is a story he told me. He found the back half of the car in the Ghost Desert, and uh, it was excessive force on it, and it was one one seven. And uh, was your dad just walking through the desert one day? And like, <laughs> <laughs> funny car chassis. He said no. Well, he was out you there, know, he was out there bird he walking. Was a mirage at first. Well, back in the day, Armagosa, the Armagosa track was huge, and my dad started off in a CJ7 Jeep racing. And uh, I, who knows with my dad on the story, but that's the story he tells me. So I'll just tell that one. Um, so he he got the car, and back in those days, if you if you guys knew uh, Jerry Lowry, he was a one of them guys that could make any piece of crap run really good for that race. And uh, so he they put the car together, and he ran a lot of nitrous. I mean, they'd take the biggest jet they had and drilled it out bigger. Hey, we don't want to step on any toes here with any more nitrous. <laughs> 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 you know, but uh, my dad started off with a CJ7 or CJ5. I can't remember what Jeep it was, honestly. But uh, and they just ran nitrous. They found the back half of this chassis in Armagosa and they put the car together and ran more nitrous. And nice. Um, then slowly it changed into a blower car with nitrous and then it just became blower. But there's no meaning to the number to it. Other than that's what he found it with. And, and his new car is uh, 118, right? Yeah, so we just so uh, we just kind of went with it. So at a short period of time, I think uh, Randy Kimball owns the buggy now. We had a buggy for Kimble. a second. Oh, yeah. Kimble. Kimble. Um, so And we had the Draxter, so we just went 117X, 118X, and then 119X. And that's just kind of how we did it. But I, I mean, that's our original number is one one seven X. So cool. Yeah, no good story on that one. <laughs> that hey, I, don't, I don't know. Freaking walking through the desert, a mirage of a funny car appears. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of. I got my hey. Who knows what my dad? What story is true or not? But you know. Yeah. So I got a question for um, this is basically for everybody. Uh, just to the tracks you've been to in your lifetime, uh, which one has been your favorite, and which track that you have not been to, are you really, really trying to get to? Would love to get to the most, and uh, we'll have let's have Tristan and Kylie go first. All right. So I am pretty biased, but it's a tough bias because. Um, let me start off by giving Esteban Juarez credit. Dome Valley is one of the best tracks in the country by far. It's it's such a well-run, well-groomed location. They're such nice folks. My personal preference is Elsinore. I, I have a better 60 foot there. And then the rest of it, past 60 foot, is about the same. Um, and it's about 15 minutes from my house. So that is hard to beat. Um, so that's my favorite track. Now... A track I'd really like to go to, and, and I'm really going to try. It's just a matter of uh, the motorhome and trailer have like 14 tires on the ground, and I got to buy 16 to go. But we want to go to Michigan bad for that um, Apple Tree Automotive deal in August. Yeah, the Larry Wagner Memorial yes, Race. Sir. Yeah. yeah. I, I have, a, I literally just bought something from Apple Tree Auto like 20 minutes ago for Kylie's car, and <laughs> I have a lot of Apple Tree Auto shit on my car. I, really like those boys I, I respect their program i respect that racetrack um my dad went there in the 90s and um i would like to go there and check that out that place looks really pretty it looks like a fast track and uh well ran yeah silverback kills it they really do yeah i agree with elsinore's our home we love elsinore but dome valley does a really good job they have i feel like they've done even better the longer yeah it's been They've really stepped up their game lately. And and uh, I, I mentioned Dome, and that's no slight to Avenal. Avenal is a really nice track, too. But if I had if I had to choose, it's Elsinore for sure. It's, I like it there. All right. I, I uh, think I want to go to Thunder Valley, though. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. 
Let's go. We'll take you anytime. We'll take you anytime. What's the yeah, Albany? Albany. 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 Yeah. Those are my top two tracks we haven't been to yet. Awesome. Well, yeah, we'd love to have you Thunder Valley. But yeah, I would love to get to Albany too. I've never been to Albany. Um, Kayla's been there a few times. I'm, never I'm for a car there, race yeah. though. Never for not a car for race. a car race. I'm trying to. I, it's not going to happen this year, but I'm hoping 2025 I can make it up there for a car race. Uh, but yeah, Albany. That's that's a pretty track. I mean, the tree line and everything. Like they got water and electric hookups for the motorhomes. It's it's nice. Yeah. I don't want to speak before it's present, but Caleb will be making more car races in 2025 for sure. Guarantee that. <laughs> <laughs> Guarantee that. Awesome. Eric, um, where are we going? Where's your favorite track? Yeah. Um, so I, 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 this is the first year, or I guess last year, technically the last race of it was the first time I went to Dome Valley. Um, Dome Valley has my heart. I think they have the best track out there. Um, and I think they put on a great race. Uh, Elsinore is really good too. I think too. I mean, Elsinore and Avenal are really good, but I just, Dome Valley on the West Coast for me. Um, races I want to go to, I really want to go to Missouri. Yeah. I think Missouri, from what I see at least, is a really fast track, and they get a lot of cars, a lot of fast cars. And uh, so Missouri is definitely on my bucket list. If I could do it the way I want to do it, I'd re- I would want to hit a Toka because I've never been there. And then I want to go straight from there to Missouri. and. Uh, I want to go beat up on you Midwest guys all day long. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk. We can talk after this, and uh, we can. We can. I have a, a question here, Billy. What's up? So uh, obviously, us West Coasters, we uh, we don't have a lot of tracks active now, but we have had quite a few tracks in the past. Um, mm. So out of the tracks that are no longer running, that you know you guys have been to um whether you've raced there or just like running around you know while like our dads were racing and stuff what is your your favorite defunct track great question we'll go with we'll go with uh eric um since you were speaking last on it man if we could either get armagosa back or avi Ooh, avi was a cool avi was an awesome race Right there on the river. So I, I would honor, I would go to Avi before I went to Armagosa, but Christine yeah. Kylie, what about you guys? Um, so I agree with Avi because I wanted to do our honey, honeymoon there, but that never happened. But just listening to him and his dad talk about all the past tracks, um, I would say Glen Helen or Prince. Mm-hmm. Wow. Prim. I, I've been to Prim once when I was in eighth grade. It was awesome. It was, <laughs> it, it was amazing. I was just a little Kansas kid going to Prim. We went the whole time. It was amazing. It was when Dennis Reich and Joe Betancourt had their accidents in the same race. Same yeah. would, you, would you guys say Prim was not a good track, but it was the best event to go to? For sure. Yes. I'd agree with that. I'd agree with that. Too rocky. That was You didn't want to stand yeah. behind the cars at Prim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. In in our generation or our lifetime, if I had if I had to pick within our lifetime, it would be Prim. Be just yeah, the location was awesome. But uh, I got the tail end of Glen Helen, and that was that was cool. Glen Helen would be really cool to have back again, or at least the way it was, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was boy. I was the same as you there, Tristan. Just like a little tyke around there. Um, in the Glen Helen days, Glen Helen was, uh, I think, something that I would say a lot of the old timers took for granted with how how they ran the show there, and that was a cool cool facility. Um, I I think I'd still go with Amargosa though. I just have so many fond memories of Amargosa. Just the like, cheeseburgers. Uh, the cheeseburgers. <laughs> okay, you guys, if you don't know. The the best, and I, I'm going to say this over in and out, and I, that may be blasphemous, and that's fine. And Eric, shut up about your Whataburger. <laughs> I don't care. Yeah, Whataburger's yeah. better. In and out. Amargosa cheeseburgers are the best cheeseburgers on the planet. 
I'm so I sorry agree. you never got to have him, Billy. I agree. Well, if they're better than In and Out, that ain't hard to beat. <laughs> Waterburger is better than In and Out, but Armagosa Burgers probably beat them all. Them fighting words. <laughs> well, we can have that debate later. Got team Team In and Out over here versus Team Whataburger. <laughs> yeah. tell, tell us in the comments on this podcast if you're Team In and Out or Team Whataburger. <laughs> yeah, let me know so I can unfollow you. <laughs> I'll unfriend you on Facebook if I. Oh boy. <laughs> so anyway, um, as you guys know, SoCal Sand Drag Association came out and they announced that they're not running the motorcycle classes at their next event. Which you know they need to rename that because there's no motorcycles that run; they're all ATVs. <laughs> but uh-huh. what? How do you guys? You know, starting out on ATVs and whatnot. Now you're racing in cars and top eliminator. How do how do you feel about that judgment on their behalf to take out the motorcycles, ATVs? Well, um, oh, this is gonna be bad. Well, okay, in their defense, they did start out out on ATVs, but they started out as kids, and they mm-hmm. kept the kids quad classes. That's true. Yes, they they are keeping the kids um intact for that. So. I think that'd be more of a hill to die on right now. That'd be a bummer. But <laughs> tell you what, um, I am very torn on this topic, but I, I do have a really strong stance. And Caleb, I'm going to clear some shit first so that um, people stop talking shit. You, you weren't talking shit on that podcast. I listened to it pretty thoroughly. <laughs> people got ruffled. And that's um, for lack of better terms, a PG-13 kids plug years, that's fucking bullshit. Now, moving forwards, the bike class. I really like the bikes. I love the diversity of sand drag racing. I love um, how many different ways there are to skin this cat. There's so many fast bikes and so many different configurations and so many different classes. It's unbelievable. It's so thriving right now. I think that SoCal sand drags got... Um, tired of the complaining because and i'm just speaking from a, a business owner's standpoint here but i tell my guys don't bring me a problem bring me a problem with a suggested solution and we'll, we'll, we'll work from there and from my standpoint which is way the fuck over in the top eliminator lane and i don't really have a lot of grounds to stand on nor do i really care to but there weren't a lot of solutions being provided. There was just a lot of people causing problems. And, and that's all Chachi gets every day is people complaining. Nobody goes up to that guy and shakes his hand and says, Hey man, thanks for what you do for the sport. Cause I've done that. And he's really cool if you do that. But if you give the guy shit and you, and you just constantly hound the guy with complaints and no solutions, then what's happened is people are suffering the repercussions of their actions and they're not happy about it. And and it's like when you break up with a crazy chick and it, and it's justifying itself right now, everybody's throwing this crazy fit and saying some wild shit. That's just not really, uh, in my opinion, I really care about the people who run SoCal sand drags and whether that was a good idea or not, I stand beside them because they were thinking like a business and there's a lot of passion in this sport. And, and I understand that that tends to um, make your uh, uh, judgment hazy. But what's being done right now is, is hurting the bike class. And it sucks because I was telling Caleb, I'd really like to build a fast four stroke. I'm 255 pounds, dude. I'm not going to be no fucking no like weight class bike racer or nothing. But I just like the class. I loved racing it when I was a kid and it was fun. Um, but not with the way that people are acting right now. That's not the way you do it. And, and I'm biased. But Top Eliminator is a classy group of folks, man. And we don't have problems with Chachi. And we don't have problems with Avenal. We don't have problems with anybody. Anybody who runs these racetracks. We need to give these people some respect. This is a, again, mind my fucking French. But this is a motherfucker to run these racetracks. And it ain't that profitable. So these people are doing it for the love of the sport. Um, now, the flip side of it, <clears throat> I will say on your guys' on the bike side, um, I really feel for you, Caleb, because you do a lot, a lot for us West Coast racetracks, and it's and you race a bike, so that sucks. Because I would be really chapped if Top Eliminator got taken away. But if the people within Top Eliminator were were saying the shit that 
is being said right now in the bike classes, I would understand it. I know that's a crazy stance. That's not even a crazy stance. That's just a matter of fact stance mm. I take on that and 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 bring on the hate comments. I, I really don't mind it. No, I like, mean, I, I, people, hey, can we, understand, we, people can understand yeah. a stance and, you know, you take it a certain way. It is what it is. Social media gets everybody a voice, unfortunately. And, you yeah. know, um, <laughs> and but on the other side of what you're kind of saying, Tristan, what would you say to some of the bike guys who say that, they cater more to the cars than they do the ATVs at th those set events at SoCal and even Avenal maybe. Sure. So, okay. Uh, I have thought about that. Uh, I do a lot of dirt work for a living and I, I haven't heard any form of a solution other than that SoCal Sandrags just needs to go spend more money on a different program, which here's the thing. Dome Valley is really good to the um, prep wise, to the bikes and the side by side. When you say pro, excuse me. When you say program, do you mean like the the track prep, like track to prep. do all the yeah. stuff like that? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but I lose about a tenth when I take my big car there uh, in my sixty foot time. Now that's my car, and I will say Kylie's car is a little closer to consistent there to Elsinore translating, but um, I lose about a tenth when I go there. I don't complain. I just turn my car up and figure it out. And, and, you know, that's not necessarily something the bike guys can do because they are winging the fuck out of these things. And, and what are you going to do? Shed 20 pounds to make up a tent? Like, I, I understand. But the flip side of it is I, I have not heard a solution. And I honestly haven't put much thought into a solution for that department because I don't ride a bike. But I help with the track prep at Lake Elsinore. And, I, I, you know, before we start, at least afterwards, I drive my car. But before, if somebody has an idea or a suggestion or an idea, I said idea twice, just tell us, like, give us an idea. Don't just come up ready to fight. That's not the way to do this. We need to be adults. This is a business. Let's, let's look at this. Like, like, uh, this is a problem. Let's solve it. Let's not fucking type on Facebook and be really vile people. Let's make this right. Because I want to see bikes back. I, I don't like that they're gone either, but this is kind of what it's come to because of the circumstances. Okay. Okay. Eric, what, what are your thoughts on it? And then I'll, I, I want to kind of give uh, a little bit of a rebuttal to, to some of those things just to, you know, I, just so people aren't hating on you, Tristan, because I think all your points there are very valid. Um, but yeah, I want, let, let's hear what Eric has to say about that. And then I'll give, you know, some things in there from, from being on the other side of it at, you know, this decision point and, you know, kind of things where, where I'm seeing, but it's good to see from your guys' perspective, you know, standing outside of that bubble, what's, what's going on. Yeah. Cause I've heard nothing but the other side. I haven't never heard the opposing side until really just now. So, I mean, I'm just taking it all in. So go ahead, Eric. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I don't know anything about really bad talking one way or the other. I know last race I heard a little bit with uh, the promoter and a few of the bike guys, but uh, this is my theory about the bikes is uh, some of them bike guys have just as much money, if not more money in their bikes as we do our, our cars. And some of them are just as quick as us. Um, I also think they're, they're just as important as us car guys and they can get more rounds done of bikes. They can put on a better show, you know, without dragging the track, you know? Um, so I look at it as an outsider. I mean, I used to run bikes, but uh, they're just, they're money to the sport and the more bikes we can get, that's more money. I mean, Caleb might be able to correct me. I think they charge about the same for entry for pro one and pro two as like a sport or pro class. I mean, okay. so that's more money into helping us promote the racing uh, and more money to put more races on perhaps. Um, so I, I'm not against bikes at all. I think they're a very key element to sand drags. So I'm all, I, I don't know all the all the problems. I know that they're just really helpful for the sport, and they help with uh, 
putting on a good show for the fans. And also, like, yes, some bikes are really quick and they're a lot of money. But a lot of bikes, like Pro 2 bikes, you can enter in a stock bike, a stock Polaris, and run it and have fun. And it gets you into the sport for more future races and more uh, money into the sport. So that's your key in for the spectators. Okay, I can race my stock Polaris. And then they're going to say, oh, I want to go faster. And they put more (laughs) into it. Then they get their kids into it. And it's just you know it's their start and say they don't want to run bikes no more now they got more cars they want to buy a car so i i don't really know what happened this last race in on the west coast with the bikes but i i i think bikes need to be there and we need to support bikes just like a top fuel car you know they're just as important as any of us car guys yeah so yeah, that's sure. that. some, some general thoughts and stuff like i i think you're right eric you know it um there you know you're right there there's some bikes out there that have a lot of money in them um and i know that probably some of the the west coast events that that have had cars haven't seen as many of those super high dollar builds um because those are typically ones where they end up going to you know these atb only events and the the big races that happen in Louisiana and Kentucky and stuff like that. Um, but there are, it is an economical way for people to get into the sport. And, you know, just like having the kids classes, this sport, as you guys both, you know, can t- attest to, you know, there's, there's a lot of these stepping stones to, to get up into the ranks and, you know, bikes are a great Avenue to get your feet wet in the sport and then, you know, go up from there. Um, what what Tristan was saying as far as like the complaints and stuff, a hundred percent. And I I will tell you guys, the bike crowd we're a fickle bunch, and and we were very vocal about when we don't like things. Um, so I hundred percent agree. This goes for any track, any event promoter, any race director, any track staff. Don't give people an attitude. It, 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 this is just a general life thing. Don't give people an attitude. You're, you're not going to get your way by throwing a fit and yelling at people. You're going to get your way by coming at them, as Tristan said, calmly and trying to provide a solution to your problems. And don't punch them in the face. And try not to punch them in the face. That, <laughs> that generally, generally helps. Um, but I will say this too, you know, and, and you're right. You know, you're looking out and seeing, seeing those complaints, especially the comments section and stuff after this, Tristan. But I definitely have seen in the past, healthy conversation and and suggestions on different things, whether it's using, whether it is, you know, you're right, you guys need to get a different implement and spend a couple hundred grand to, to do so. That's, that's not a realistic solution. But even just ideas to use the current equipment um, in a different way, or, or you know, if there's an, an extra grader that, that only gets used um, every now and then or something for different parts of the facility, um, there have been solutions for that. And even even stuff on um, just race procedures and stuff of when the bikes are going to run, you know, this or that. And I do know that the bike crowd has felt that when they have come with these more reasonable solutions, that they're just told no that won't work we we you know whether it's they actually can't do it that way or don't want to do it that way is a whole different conversation (laughs) um but it's it's just that you have some of those people that are a little bit more level-headed in their approach and they kind of feel like they get shut down and so those people stop giving the suggestions and then the only people that are talking are are the people that you're hearing tristan that they're going out there you know, yelling at people and, and blowing up the comment sections and, and stuff like that, which, you know, I, I do want to say this, like bike guys that are doing that, like we need to come and talk to each other and like come to consensus that that's not the right way to handle it. Well, I like I said on the episode when we kind of touched on it, um, it just seemed like that they thought the bikes were a nuisance and they saw their out to get them out of the program and 
they kind of took their opportunity on it because of the uh, events that happened with certain people. So um, I don't know, but it, it, uh, learning from the other side aspect and, you know, like, you know, being a race promote, being a starting line guy myself last year, like sometimes you do get a lot of shit from people and, you know, not everybody's going to be very kind to you because I mean, when you're, when you're at their race and you're only thinking about what you and your team's trying to accomplish with their machine. So sometimes people do kind of lose their cool and lose sight of things. And then, but at the same time, you can't just go off and try to impose your will on the track owner just because you feel like you're wronged all the time. Um, I have a suggestion if that is reasonable. <clears throat> absolutely not you're a big bully right now yes yes good. <laughs> I'm just, good i'm just kidding go ahead dude well a couple things one for those of you guys running your mouths i i it's just not the right way to do things and and i understand the frustration and anger but especially atta attacking one of your own is not the move um second there's a lot of amazing fabricators in this sport i am not one of them but i built two cars that stayed together for the most part uh how come, and, and I'm not saying that this is anybody's responsibility, but if you're really that bothered by the track prep, how come nobody has suggested and or fabricated something you could throw behind um, a perfecter or a disc or something on chains that's easy to do that you can throw behind it and get the prep that you guys want? If that's what you want, let's do it. Like, that's not hard to do. It takes two seconds to hook the chain up and you run bikes through. I don't give a shit. It's not going to change the way my car goes down the track. It, it doesn't matter. So let's do it. If that, if that will solve your problem or, or, you know, let's, let's try to come up with suggestions more so than um, attacking each other because this sport is small enough as it is. We don't need to be out here cut at each other's throats for no reason whatsoever. You know, I agree. I with think, that. Uh, I think that we're sand drags rather than like any HRA or something. We're, we're a lot more family oriented. We're a lot friendlier with each other, but at the same time, we're drag racers. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's all it, to us. We put a lot of money in these vehicles, whatever you race and time and effort. And at the same point, we're, we're in competition, no matter how good of buddies we are. If something goes wrong, you might find that reason why it went wrong and you're going to blow up about it because you lost or, you know, it didn't go the way you wanted. So. I just think, like, with the bikes, I know me and Caleb have talked about track prep. Um, like, I don't see why things can't be prepped for bikes, a little bit different for cars, and it gets turned into a little bit bigger deal than it needs to be. I think the the track itself, <clears throat> and I, uh, bike guys, correct me if I'm wrong, I have heard that the track can be too heavy or whatnot. And, and Caleb, am I wrong? If, if the track was just as heavy, but it had like a mid 2000s Saboba prep, like a paved road, basically, you know, like real smooth and flat, nothing, no clumps or anything. If it was just as heavy, uh, would that work better for the bike guys? I I think so. Yeah. Um, Cause you're, we're talking about, you know, two, two different components is, is how much moisture, the dirt has um and then how deep um the actual surface is so the moisture obviously you know can can screw up especially the lower horsepower bikes um but usually it's a combination of the two and i would say that the 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 early saboba days um that that surface even if it was super moist was better for bikes the water, I think, is less of a component. It's more, more the depth. Um, because you got to keep mind, you know, just like everybody's car, eventually wants to get up on top of the surface of of the track, right? We want to mm -hmm. dig enough at the start to get off the starting line, and then be up on top of the track so that we're minimizing rolling resistance down at the top end. And it's just it's harder to do that when the track is really deep for for bikes. Um, they don't have as big tires. You know, they're not pulling as much power. And and a deep track hurts them more, I think. Yeah, because they just dig down before they go forward. Well, my reason asking that is because you could still have, basically, 
in the dirt terms, you're trying to make like a, a surface layer for the bikes to run on. Kind of like flat bottom boats love to run on glass instead of chop, you know? You want to run on glass. So why couldn't, this is just BS sake of solutions, but why couldn't we make that yeah. surface with a like a great all or something of that nature? Because my car is just going to chainsaw through that shit anyways. It doesn't matter. Like I, I'll go down the track the same. It's not going to affect me. But if that makes, like, this kind of conversation is what we need. We don't need to be attacking each other. This is a solution. This could help the bikes a lot. Well, you guys got the advantage because you run the bikes and you finish them before the cars even start. So, you Yeah, that's what you, I was kind of saying is you can grade the track for the bikes to play how right. they like it. And then you regrade. I mean, we grade 400 times a day for racing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We can we can put a blade on the track and grade it for bikes how they like it. And it's it's no it's not gonna change the amount of time to grade it for cars. Let's make it where everyone's happy. And I then talk, we, only I talk to you the, to that, Eric is is uh you know obviously some of these solutions as you're talking about Tristan might take additional equipment or or tractors or something and i get that from an event promoters side of it is that any extra equipment that you're doing um or or even equipment that you need to go and swap out um it, it's time um it's money um and you know uh a, a special prep for for bikes um if if it's quick um then it, then it's okay but if it's something that's going to take a whole bunch of extra time, you, you know, you don't want it to affect the rest of the show. And I think that that's where some of the West Coast tracks and stuff have have run into issues with in the past is like we, we got to get through the show and you got to think about how any decision you're making on track prep, whether it's water you put down or type of implements you use or, or way that you're grading it with those implements how that affects the next class and the class after that. So I get that um, from an event promoter side, but I agree, Eric, from from a giving people the show, and, and if you want people to show up, sometimes you might have to make a, a concession on, you know, one of those areas to get more people out. Because bottom line, we're you know, like you said, we're all paying the same amount of money, and, you know, you're going to get different crowds of people for different vehicles out there, and and you know we need better you know car and bike count at every event. Yeah. So, so they, I talked to. I, go ahead, Eric. So they used to do this back in like the prim days and stuff. Like, and for the most part, it seems like they drag one lane at a time. On at least out here, um, they used to do like they'd get drivers do foot races on the other lane and stuff. Like, there's things we could do to entertain the crowd while the tractors are going down a lane you know for sure yeah. i've always suggested at thunder valley like having kids play some games and just have something set up to where they could you have some sort of entertainment getting yeah. kids involved is always smart you know like having do like sack you know races three-legged races stuff like that i've you know it's something funny just you can see kids doing something crazy on on that topic uh before we get away from it, I, I do want to reiterate something so that people who are chapped can understand something. I completely agree with Eric with what Eric said about um, the bikes being just as important as the cars. Um, I'll leave it at that. You guys aren't alone on that department. Every, we all feel everybody's equal. We need to be uh, transparent there, but we just need to find a happy medium, and, and have we can to acknowledge that bikes take a different track prep than cars. Sure, and we could probably come to a resolution there. We just need to be adults about it. Well, I talk, and I would say, I would say hold this on, to hold Tristan. On. Hold on, Tristan, yeah. do you want to finish something, Tristan? Uh, I was going to the next topic, so let's finish this one. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I just want, uh, I just want. Hold on, I wanted to say I talked to a SoCal racer that races bikes, and he all he had to say, all he had to say about it was really, uh, if they prepped it just like they prepped it for kids, then it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yep, same. The same track. Yep. And I will I will say this, Tristan, too. It's it's not even necessarily that um to Kyla's point that bikes and cars have to have a different track. It's just that bikes are affected by those things, that the moisture, the depth of the track a lot more 
than cars are. So cars have a wider variety of surfaces that they can run on and still be about the same number, still go down the track A to B. Bikes uh, uh, have a narrower field on the track prep where they can be successful. Not just quick going down the track, but you know, not bogging on the starting line, actually making a full A to B pass. So that that's all it is. And it's just, like you said, it's finding that happy medium that, that will work for everybody. Sure, and, and <clears throat> down to the to the bare basics of it, you know, like I said earlier, when I go to Dome Valley, I, I do lose about a tenth, sixty foot, and and I do have a lot more horsepower that I can readily grab than necessarily than a bike could, I guess. But, um, and, and it comes down to a money thing, I guess. But couldn't you run a smaller tire if the track's too heavy, so you can necessarily get the R's up quicker? Yes, uh, but you know, there's 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 lots of things with that. Yeah, it's it, part of that's a money thing. Um, part of that is How because dare we're you down tell to me such... get new tires. <laughs> hey, I switched, <laughs> tires, I switched tires at the last uh, Elsinore event, and and finally was able to get my bike going down. Um, after trying some gearing. Um, but you know, there 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 definitely is uh things that you can do. Um, that does cost money, and like we're saying, you know, there's a lot of bike guys out there that don't have as much money. And they don't yeah. necessarily want to go spend, you know, a thousand bucks on a set of tires that they only use at one facility. Um, there are things you can change, but part of it is that our bike count has gotten so low at some of the West Coast tracks that we don't have time to change anything between rounds. <laughs> um, well, you guys were so, already going to just add the bikes together in one class, right? You were going to start. There's, doing... there's been there's been talks of that, and we've done that in the past at different events. Um, but um, the the biggest thing is just going through and saying, okay, cool. You know, I'm out here. If I, if I show up and I don't run anything till Saturday and I run a Saturday class, I don't have I don't have time to change anything between rounds. So if something isn't working, there's not much I can do, and then I have to make a guess at what I can change, and change that for Sunday. And then if that doesn't work first pass, I don't have time to change anything again. And, and so you, you're literally getting basically two passes an event where you can actually, or, or three passes if you're there Friday, that you can make changes on. And obviously you guys know, you know, being able to make changes between rounds is, is paramount to, to figuring out your setup. See, they do that, like when I was running Pro 1 a lot, they do round robin kind of deal. And I don't think they need to do that. They need to give you time. I don't care if you're a top fuel car or a bike or a junior. They need to give you time to make adjustments. And they don't do that very often on the West Coast, at least. Yeah, um, I agree. I don't know. It's a fine line to walk. I, I agree with what you're saying. And that could be the solution to this problem. You know, maybe we don't change track rep, but we change the way we schedule it or you know there's there's a million different ways to skin this cat but you know at the end of the day we are racing dirt and we have to figure out how to tune to the track versus tuning the track to us like I right said. yeah so, but when there's a median but the main time. complaint with the socal racers right now that i've at least i've talked to with the atvs is that they don't feel like they have a safe track it's not that the track is necessarily bad not necessarily the surface is bad it's just they don't feel like they have a safe track and and I and I will say that that is um, I talked okay so a little insight here. My dad's best friend is Larry Snow. Larry Snow has the maroon burgundy. He'd be on my shit if I said it was anything <laughs> other than burgundy. But the burgundy buggy, and I'll tell you a story about that car after we get out of this topic. It's just a little back history on the buggies. But he drives that car, and his sister is married to Mike Cazzini. So Mike and Terry run SoCal Sand Drags. So Mike. I've known him my entire life. I talk to him weekly. I work with him. We, we are family. Um, their biggest priority is safety. And, and, and that is something that is uh, good to, good to hear that if we need to fix that, then let's fix that. There, there are solutions to be had here, but the way that people were talking on the comment section with SoCal sand drags and the decision made, I understand that was kind of a, sort of say a crude way to put it. There was kind of no heads up. It was just like, hey, bye, kind of thing. And that, I get that. Now, the way people responded, though, that's like, what the fuck, man? That's going to get the bike classes done forever. Like, that's going to make them go, well, fuck these guys. The way, the way that it was approached, I guess. Now, 
no, it's not to say everybody. There's a lot of reasonable human beings out there and, and, and affiliated with the bike class. But, man, dude, there's five or six of you guys that are really making it look bad. And, and we really just need to come together and be adults about this. And, and like you said, if they feel like it's unsafe, then, then let's, let's make it safe. Like let's come to resolution. We want to see everybody running out there and having a good time. That's what we've been doing for our entire lives. That's what we need to continue doing. Now you got a good point. You got a point. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. All right. Good. good. Um, the return lane. I've always thought about this, dude. I this is my hill to fucking die on. I swear to you. Top eliminator <laughs> runs two passes and we drag. Um, us short cars really appreciate that. Now, if you're the second car down the track, I've said it a million times. How come we can't drag the car? I won't even get out. I'll just shut the mag off, shut the car off. I'll sit in the car, have the boys come down to get me. And let's pull the car back up in front of the crowd and then get out of the car. And the kids and shit can see well, it looks like an astronaut get out of the car and get ungeared and undo the shifter bottle and read the boost gauge and bleed it off and put the parachute in the wheelie bar. And like they yeah. can see the life of what, like you see my car for three seconds. It's like, no, that was cool. And it's gone. Like let them see it, give them stickers, give them a shirt. And while the tractors are dragging, you know, it's a distraction tactic. I think you need to go to Atoka, Tristan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I definitely think we should do the return lane, give out shirts, stickers, let the fans see the car a little closer up. Is the I mean, return you, lane only used to go one way to go pick them up? Yeah. yeah. I mean, lane. tell them to change it. The, you can see the fans at, uh, at like, <laughs> Elsinore look behind them when they're going back to camp. So, I mean, it would definitely be cool to do the return lane. <clears throat> Yeah, and you, I, should, I you guys should totally don't... do that. You should just start doing it. Don't even ask. Just start doing it. <laughs> I've heard that they don't allow that just because of, like, safety regulations or insurance or whatever. But I agree, Tristan. Like, that's one thing I think we need to do in general with a sport is, you know, every everything needs to be, you know, brought up just a better marketing, better interaction with the fans, you know, um, growing up. I'm sure we all did this because a lot of cars out there had big, bright names on it. You know, this same as old, you know, old, old school pavement racing or monster trucks or whatever. Even if you didn't know, if I didn't know that Tristan Graham drove whiskey business, I'd be like, Oh, the whiskey business buggy. Yeah. Or, you know, Eric, Oh, the excessive force altered. Yeah. That, that needs to be, you know, something that we, we try to promote a little bit better. And, and yeah, that can... is a good way to do it. Yeah, I mean, we can throw food at Eric when he comes back up the return lane. It's so good. It's, it's a good idea. <laughs> and that, and this isn't just like an Elsinore problem per se. This is like no, this is everywhere. most places. Yeah, I mean, Silverbacks really stepped up. Dome's really stepped up. And, uh, you know, everybody, everybody's just got to get on this thing and start doing a little better to get more eyes on their tracks and stuff. Um, so, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I think promotion is a big thing with these these older generation promoters. I mean, I'm not talking shit about anyone, honestly, but like Elsinore could do a better job promoting. Like Dome Valley, and I just go to them because I've had really good experiences there, but like they get billboards. They put it out there on the internet on multiple different pages. Uh, and you don't really see that through Elsinore or Avenal. Um, Avenal is what, what I know about Avenal. It's a really small farming town and you get all the locals, but there's many farming towns around there. They could do a little better job, but I just don't see a lot of promoting as I do with uh, Dome Valley. Dome Valley really tries to get their stuff out there. And I yeah, think that Dome does a great out job. Out Shout out to Esteban. And then they get an insane crowd. So, what was that, Kylie? What yeah. was that, Kylie? <laughs> it's a good point. Dome Valley is also a small farming town, and they, but they, they get, get tons of tons of. Yeah, spectrum. but they're right next to Yuma, though. Well, Elsinore's right there next to San Diego <laughs> and L.A. Yeah, no, Eric's totally. Well, this is a shot of Greg Tonga because I know he runs the Facebook. So, Greg, you better start advertising a little more on that Facebook page. Yeah, what's up, Gregory? Hey, no. I will say he's on it. Uh, um, Esteban, 
has nailed the advertising department with that. He he is so good with media and uh and it shows it, dude. I I I remember it was like surreal. I made a pass in the left lane of my car and it was like I I, I shut down and the on the left lane there's about a six foot high, it's like K rail, three hundred feet, and then it the shutdown, it's like six foot high uh, hay bales. The people back their trucks up and stand on the bed and watch you down there. And I think this day in particular, there was like 3,000 people there. It was lined all the way to the end of the shutdown. Like I was getting out of my car and there's people talking to me across the racetrack. It was unbelievable. It was the coolest shit. I've never seen anything like it. He sent me a picture of my dad's car on a billboard in Yuma. I mean, (laughs) you know how cool that is for us little folk? So that's awesome. I, I just think like the West, I, I was telling Caleb the other day, like it really seems like the Midwest East coast is really booming with sand drags and the West coast used to be the top dog on sand drags and we're kind of dying out and we need to fix that. You know? I mean, I think you'd be a little bit surprised if you came to Missouri, we are lacking Bracket card numbers, not really top eliminator card numbers, but we're lacking bracket card numbers. Uh, our our bikes are still loud and proud, which is good. Um, certain places are losing bike numbers, not just Elsinore, but like I know Atoka's down on their bike numbers. Uh, but they're growing in their card numbers, which is good. And uh, I know there's just other certain tracks more on the East Coast. Um, that don't get a lot more attention as they shoot as they probably should but um either way i mean we just got to kind of work together and you know it's kind of like why we started world sand drag news is to get more eyes on the sport everywhere you know so do a really good job at it i'd have to say like you guys um not to take anything away from tom bray he did a really good job too but you guys i think really have stepped it up got it out there i mean you guys got a really i it seems like you got a pretty good YouTube following and social, like all social media, you got a good following. So I just want to say thank you guys, especially Caleb, because I deal with him more than you, Billy. Sorry. But yeah, uh, fair enough. You guys, you guys have, re- I think you guys have really stepped up the game on the social media end of it. Well, I appreciate that for sure. And yeah. I just want to say about Tom Bray real quick, um, you know, he's the goat of what we're trying to do. And he was the foundation of what we're trying to build this thing on. And, you know, we're just trying to keep it going. So shout out Tom Bray. Absolutely. Yeah. It's um pretty incredible what you guys have done just from a personal standpoint, dude, I don't think of, of, of us, me and my wife more than what's in this three car garage. Uh, we're, we're just, we're just, losers with buggies we're buggy dorks and um <laughs> i heard about your guys's podcast and I, I found it and i started listening and there's dudes in like north carolina who know my like knows my name and knows what i'm doing and she was like this is un- this is wild like it's, you guys are legit world sand drag news i can't believe there's dudes being flown out to dubai and shit racing oh. right now that is really cool really cool to to keep tabs on and to actually hear because um Otherwise, like I said, it really wouldn't get farther than this three-car garage. I don't really know what's going on in the world. You guys are really keeping sharp tabs on it. Hey, but when you run a record number for what you have, Caleb will just talk shit about it. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully he does. <laughs> That's funny. And we and uh, don't forget uh, when we're talking about records. Don't forget world's fastest beam car right there. There's a drive for it. <laughs> Don't you fucking forget it, dude. 344, okay? <laughs> oh, man. We're going to do race picks for the Lake Elsinore race coming up. And uh, since we got two top eliminator drivers, we'll just do – everybody's going to pick a winner from the top eliminator class. We'll just make it easier. So uh, we'll have Mr. Eric Hickey go first. Your top eliminator race pick for Lake Elsinore. I'm going to go with the guy who's been dominating top eliminator, Jim Nafsinger. He's all on helping me in my motor, so we're definitely going for him. <laughs> there you go, Jim. Shout out to Barney. Um, uh, Tristan, who's your pick? Well, I like how you. I want to go back on something real quick. I like how you said two top eliminator drivers here because, uh, you know, um, Kylie's pretty proficient top eliminator. We'll see about Eric, but 
Um, <laughs> oh, I was talking about I was talking about Eric and Kylie. Hey, oh, I, yeah, yeah. hey, I won Dome Valley. Okay. Damn, that backfired big time. But I won top limit. You got to hit me. Yeah, you know Eric what? did win top limit there, Dome. You know what? I was gonna say my dad because he just got a fresh motor, but I think he might try to uh, get the record alongside me. So, if that is the case, I got to hand it to the dude who handed it to me last about well, two races ago or whatever it was. Uh, Larry Snow in the finals. Larry's gonna Ooh, get it. Larry Good Snow. Dick. Next race. Calm down. I'm what, col- what color is his buggy again? It's red. <laughs> Make sure you tell him it's red. <laughs> <Maroon>. <laughs> Caleb, who's your top illuminator pick? Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start some fights over here with the Graham Crack. I uh, Graham <laughs> Graham Cracker. Graham Cracker I'm going go. for Mr. Jimmy to pass because he's gonna get that Graham Cracker killer mm. throttle stop on that Jeep and he's gonna go out there and run two ninety five and finally finally get it done in top eliminator. All right. I think Jimmy DePass is definitely going to win pro. He's got that. He's going to get that new motor dialed in. He's going to win pro mod for sure. Ooh. I was standing there next to him when he put that thing together. And uh, that is the most confident 250 man I've ever met in my entire life. I, I agree. He He's a bad dude. Whether it's pro mod or top eliminator, I, I would definitely. That's a good pick. So I got to sandbag his way to that win. Kylie, who, who's your pick? And you can't choose yourself. Oh no! I no! I would never <laughs> pick myself. <laughs> she can chose herself. I'm, I think I'm gonna pick Messinger only because he bit beat me in second round last race. He's hard so to beat. I have to lose to winners. That's right. <laughs> hey, but just so you know, maybe I'll be at Caleb's wedding on Dome Valley, but my car will be entered in at Dome Valley for points. <laughs> Go me on Dome Valley for the win. Be over technicality. <laughs> That's a win. That is a hey, win. You know, I've actually thought about that. Vegas, I'm sorry, not Vegas. Um, our Vegas, San Diego is closer <laughs> to Dome Valley than than my house is. So like we could put your car and well, you could just bring your own car. We could put our cars in the trailer and go to the wedding and then go honeymoon at Dome Valley. No, the race is like we go the same day. Fires, but we wouldn't make it the we'd make first round and we'd have to haul ass to San Diego. Oh, it's vice versa. Never mind. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> just, just qualify. Yeah. yeah thanks yeah. a lot, Caleb. Oh, I don't think... speaking of which let's <laughs> let's plug um yeah uh if you guys want to help out weddings are freaking expensive. It's it's yes. pretty stupid. Hold on um, Caleb hold on hold on because I didn't get my race pick yet. Ah, okay, <laughs> go for it, Billy. <laughs> we'll cut out. We'll cut that. Well, I'll cut out that your little start to that. So we'll pretend that didn't happen, and I'll cut out <laughs> what I just said. But my race pick for Lake Elsinore Top Illuminator class, uh, just because I've chosen kind of his partner in crime, but now I'm gonna choose him. Uh, Mark Punos, another another Vegas guy. He's uh. You know, I, w- I went with Terry Crawford last time, but I'm gonna go. With- Why are you shaking your head, Eric? I'm going with I'm going with Punos. Okay, so so I'm a Vegas guy, and I hang out with Mark, Terry, and Jim all the time. Uh, here's the problem with Mark and Terry, not necessarily Jim. Um, they want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> they will gas on that light or red light so bad, they might get lucky and get the good light. But they they want to go home, uh, so they're. Mm. Well, hey, when, when Mark window. goes home, he's going to take first place with him. So I'm, my there pick is go. Mark Punos. I hey. love Mark and Terry, but they would just want to go home. Jim's the <laughs> one that, hey, out of that outfit, Jim's the only one that wants to compete and win. <laughs> hey, I have something to add. Uh, I will be competing in Top Eliminator too, so you know. Thanks, guys. <laughs> no, that, that, no, that's still up in the air. It's not decided yet. Yeah, hey, with see. that, Emmy, you're going to break out. Back. You're going to go 70s for sure with that Emmy, so that you're not even in the class. I already said that you weren't counted as one of the two when I said we had two top luminary drivers. I already upgraded you to top alcohol. Yeah. Oh, man. 
Don't be saying that Hammond's going to hear that. That's hey, fine. in a couple of years, I'll, I'll be pro mod. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to be top eliminator. I'm going to be. My goal is to set the record, and then I'm going to be a top eliminator scumbag the rest of my life. I love that class. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool class. Yeah, but Mark, Mark is due for a win, though. I'm sorry, Eric. Mark's due for a win. He's right. Uh, I just say they're not due for a win. They have cars to beat. They just want to go home, so they don't really care. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> okay, well, okay, we'll end this recording on this. Uh, Caleb's got a plug. Oh yeah, so uh, you guys were talking about getting married and I, figuring out all the situation with bringing cars and trying to figure out how to do that and go to the wedding. Um, thank you guys, I, I really appreciate it. It's awesome to have some Sandrick family there. Um, but yeah, weddings are expensive. Um, that, that part sucks. Uh, definitely only planning on doing this once, um, if nothing else, for that fact. Uh, but if you guys want to help out, and I know Billy's got one coming up here pretty soon too, um, we'll uh, we'll put the plug the wedding registry in there. Help us uh, go to our honeymoon. We're going to Disney World, which is not cheap either. Um, but yeah, uh, if if you're part of the Sandrag family and and you want to give back to World Sandrag News, uh, do that through me and Billy uh, with wedding registries. Uh, Billy's going to have his soon. We'll probably plug that in a future episode, right, Billy? And then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll throw it we'll throw it down here somewhere. Did and, you just uh, kind of do the money dance, <laughs> Philip? <laughs> I, I don't know if we're doing the money dance. Bill, I don't know if we're doing the money I dance. I my wallet, and I wrote your wife's <laughs> name on it for the money dance. <laughs> yeah, I will say. Um, got married in Havasu for a reason. Yeah, it was our honeymoon wedding. Double, <laughs> doubled up. I will say. Um, that's a good cause because you guys are putting your heart and soul and um, money into World Sand Drag News and uh, more of that the merrier. Also, Billy, I'm glad that you made um, some guy really happy and I look forward to your wedding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Shelby's going to hate you, Tristan. <laughs> I'm not putting that in. I have to pout. Man. I'm cutting that out. <laughs> Being- uh... Well, um, Eric, Tristan, and Kylie, we really appreciate your guys' time. It's been a blast. We hope to have you on sometime after Elsinore and after Caleb's wedding for a little recap of the season and everything going on with your guys' lives and whatnot. And uh, really looking forward to having you on again next time. I really, really appreciate your guys' time on this episode. Absolutely. We really appreciate your guys' time. Um, this is a really good thing you're doing for the sport. And, uh, we would love to be back on. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, I feel like me and Tristan had uh, talked about being a little more rated R before we came on here, and I felt like <laughs> good. Yeah, we um, kept it together. We'll we'll do an after dark episode. <laughs> what we yeah, need to dude. do, what you guys need to do, you guys need to do a on site pod recording at the track. Oh gosh, at the oh, yes. camp at yeah. night. Yeah, uh, just, I I can sit here, I can do it from here, and then you guys can use somebody's phone there, and it'll be it'll be awesome content. Oh man, that that is felonious activity. That'll get us canceled for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right, we're back. Isaac had to leave. We're just with John Sorg and Damian Bowers. We're going to talk about the Sand Outlaw Series race heading to America's Oasis. Shout out to America's Oasis. They are uh, having their uh, grand opening race, America's Oasis race schedule for this weekend, Thursday, March 14th, which you're listening to the episode just today. They are opening the track for, uh, they got tech inspection and event sign up for 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. So it looks like they're not doing any running on Thursday. But on Friday, they have test and tune. Oh, no, excuse me. They have open track on Thursday. So there you go. You can run uh which is basically like a test and tune you can make as many passes as you want from 1 p.m to 5 p.m there you go test and tune attack inspection and event sign up 9 a.m to noon on friday march 15th track closed for ribbon cutting and grand opening events from noon to 4 p.m and then the tracks open from 4 p.m to 10 p.m for some grudge racing action that's really cool that'd be cool to see um <laughs> Saturday, they have Aftermarket Assassin's Showdown at noon. Oh, that's their stock turbo race. 
from noon to 2 p.m. So just stock turbo. It looks like it's sponsored by aftermarket assassins. That'd be cool. Um, I think what some people are kind of looking forward to, um, or is the bracket racing from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and the that's really that's what people are kind of looking forward to who or don't really follow the Sand Outlaw series. The Sand Outlaw series guys may be looking at that uh, stock turbo class and that grudge racing stuff a little bit. But then they got the UTV down and back competition where they go down around a barrel and then come back. Um, but yeah, that bracket racing and that stock turbo race, well, the down and back competition too, those are 100% payback. Uh, first place gets 50%, second place gets 30%, and third place gets 20%. Um, I don't know how they do it if they get four in the semifinals. I guess fourth place is just out of luck. Um, so yeah. I would actually be oh, heading down. down and back sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could you do a down and back with your Jeep at oh, this I've, place? I've done a one eighty flat spin at P, on P gravel. So, well, Damien, you go first. Uh, briefly, what 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 do you think about that track? Just by looking at the pictures of it, they got a thousand foot of shutdown. Biggest thing I'm noting noticing is it's a really powdery type sand. So as long as they can get it packed in and a lot of moisture on it, that place should. Hold some serious power, but you're going to need a lot of power just to get up and moving fast. So I doubt we're going to see a lot of records change in the low, slower class, slower WSDN UTV classes, but the upper ends, the unlimiteds and whatnot, I think we might see changes in there depending on the cars that show. And also I noticed in the video a sprinkler system. Not so, something that's only, even now, really only a few tracks have that. Well, I'm glad you said something about that because they actually have an irrigation system installed to the track where they got uh, multiple sprinkler heads throughout the track. Um, I think I saw a video. They said they have 12 sprinkler heads just around the starting line for both lanes. Wow. So that's really cool. Yeah. Which on a sand track, that's a big deal. John sure. knows that clearly from Mich West Michigan Silverback. Yeah. This place Anything. looks really nice. I mean, I'm looking at it. I mean, they got permanent lighting, guardrail. I mean, every, that's permanent. They're there to stay, man. They're they're making waves. Yeah, I really and like how that it looks. concrete blocks behind the guardrail too. So, yeah, they actually have. Uh, you know, there and it was. What's interesting is that, like, you know, there's not, as of right now because like they're new. There's not really like a gate admission fee or anything like that. Like there's like, you just, you camp in an RV spot and me and John were kind of talking about it earlier. Like once one RV spot costing, like, I think we looked it up. It was like 60 bucks or something like that. And, and that's for like one night. I don't think that's a bad deal. And that, that, comes with, that, that, comes with, that comes with water and electric too. Yeah, we were looking at that. That was a really good deal. Now, if you if you have an RV, that that is a great deal. Someone like me who doesn't have water to hook up to, all I've got is electric, and even then we take our own generator for that. They have primitive camping options options as well. So, yeah, then you don't need to spend the gas and run a generator. True. Yeah. But no, from what working. people have explained to me, like I, I think you explained to me. You and Caleb last week we were talking about it just a little bit. This is more of a resort with a racetrack, sort of something you're seeing in the um road racing world where they people are building their own condos at the racetrack to where they can keep their equipment there. Oh yeah. It's just like when I say whenever I whenever I do the uh, ad read for them, you know, there's like you the you can stay there for you know, they have annual, weekly or daily packages you know and they <clears throat> excuse me they uh hold on let me pull it up do they have a gate fee or yeah. anything billy i mean that oh well, that's what i was saying they don't really have a gate fee they you just have to buy like a, a an rv spot you just gotta be there and if you show up you show up and everybody can watch for free is what you're saying i believe so i mean right now i mean Right. Kind That's of like cool. a park pass. 
Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how it cool. is for this weekend, at least. But then you have to, like, when it comes to all the racing stuff, you have to pay for your tech inspection card, and then you have to pay for, um, you know, your entry fees and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, as far as I know, there ain't no, there's no gate fee or admission fee right now. That could change awesome. in the future. That could change in the future as they get more popular and right, rightfully so. I mean, that's sure. Just, that's really awesome. So yeah, they got RV sites, one bedroom cabins, barns, primitive camping. Uh, yeah, they got a lot of cool things to do. They got multiple racing tracks. They got short course racing. Um, now I was talking to the promoter. Uh, less. I guess he's the track promoter, excuse me, the track promoter less. And uh, he's talking about like a bunch of things they can do to kill time. If drag racers need more time to, you know, in between rounds or something like that. And like, you know, you, you can just like have other options to be entertained while waiting on the racing to come, which oh, is totally. really awesome, which is really awesome. So um, I'm actually going there. And by the time you guys listen to this, I'll I'll be there. I'm already there. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's gonna be a great time, and I'm really excited. And uh, let us know how the grading equipment and stuff looks. I'm curious to see what. Oh, they that, do I'm I'm that glad goes. you said that because what I was told, and I'll confirm this once I get there. Um, they have 45 foot wide lanes. Wow. Yeah, that Porter Tree's putting some high powered lasers on the timing system there just to get across the lane yeah it's gonna be he said he said they well i can't remember exactly what he said about the lights but it is port tree and uh um uh yeah if they can make it across that lane at 45 feet that's pretty good uh yeah obviously other tracks have struggled with that distance so oh yeah Oh, they but that was also great... race America. How wide? Is, how wide is those? Uh, the what they use to grade the track at uh, Michigan? How wide are those? Uh, see, there's uh, the blades are twelve foot. The uh, overall total width is about fourteen feet. And that's on each tractor. Correct. And you do two tractors in one lane at a time. Is that right? Correct. If I remember right, and it's You're just at a enough. Lane here. So it's, it's like it's it's really not different. quite enough. It's it's really not quite enough, but it, it is enough. So it's like twenty eight feet ish. Yeah, ish. ish. That'd be the, yeah. the big side, yeah. Okay. Cause he said that I was talking to Les and he said that they got uh thirty foot wide. Then they're gonna build one basically, is what he said. Wow. Saying. And they're gonna do like they're gonna have it angled so it like centers all the sand back into the middle where everybody likes to line up. So it'll just fill in the holes nice and then it'll pack it back down. So yeah, put it in a V. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it'll be nice. Hopefully there'll be enough weight to like, you know what I mean? At the end of it, yeah. to like settle it back down. So, yeah. Definitely going to be interesting. It will be interesting because uh, Randy Kimbley is. You know, I, you know, he's Which been cars he's taken. He's been dealing with some health issues, so hopefully he will still be there by the time this is played. But if he is there on Saturday, he's going to bring out Blue Dog, and he's going to bring out uh, one of his drag bikes, and he said he's excited. I talked to him on the phone earlier today. We're recording on Tuesday, and he said he's excited. So, um, well, here's hoping yeah, he gets uh, if he's if he if he's at the track on Saturday. You know, good. If he's not, then um, that's okay. And I just hope if he's not, then he just gets better. Right. What were you saying? I was just saying, hopefully he's getting the feeling better by then. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, he said he say he'll bring Blue Dog out, and uh, you know, if you know if Blue Dog if Blue Dog runs well, then we could see this track possibly be uh, Mid America track mid america race series that'd be cool yeah it would be cool i know that's a different subject but how's that going or um just yeah just kind of um i haven't heard back from Atoka. i haven't heard back from Atoka yet about that
but I did hear that Atoka uh, racers voted on Pro One ATV being a pro light for now. So, nice. Yeah, that's a step in the direction. So, um, and I got Jeff on board with those rule changes. I just haven't heard from Atoka yet, which is no big deal, no biggie. Yeah. Every time, you know, we'll get it rolling. Totally. Well, I think that's the end of the Paddle Talk episode. Um, once again, check out our social medias, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Check out our website for all of our list of records. And uh, check out for our content on Lake Elsinore this weekend, brought to you by Caleb. Uh, check out the content brought to you by me from the America's Oasis Sand Outlaw Series race. Um, oh, forgot to plug it. Uh, Puerto Rico is racing this weekend. So there's that. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know much about who all or what classes are going to be running down there. Probably their bracket and Turbo Street. And then, obviously, on the flyer, I see Raptor and the U.S. Army Jeep. Well, here's a flyer for everybody who just... There it is. We we talked about Puerto Rico race. There you go. We'll do a race preview for that next week. Um... There's a lot going on this weekend. Next week will be wonderful. Yeah. And then, uh, so next week, yeah. Thank you for saying that, John. We'll have the, we'll have the results from the Santa Outlaw Series race. We'll have the results from Elsinore. Uh, we'll talk about the Puerto Rico race a little bit because we know something's going to happen over there. Something cool. I didn't mean anything like that that they're going to wreck. <laughs> Something epic. Okay, calm a down. Time, calm down. I didn't say you they were going to wreck. I just said something cool was going to happen. You said you record. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I said something <laughs> cool was going to happen. It's it. I love my Puerto Rican friends. They got some crazy machines, that's for sure. Um, And then next week we will also have the Dome Valley um preview because they race not this Saturday, but next Saturday. So that'd be cool. And oh, the heads that will turn at that race. <laughs> It'll be a good race. We'll see what happens. This is Paddle Talk. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>